great. So guys, um, welcome to Mike Talks. These are inspirational talks to support a strong level of resilience. Testing one, two. A couple of years ago, I was um, asked, requested for coaching services by a former colleague of mine in my distant corporate past. She had just landed this incredible role as an HR executive in this global altruistic organization. And uh, she was absolutely excited and she was nervous. And she looked at me and she said, Mike, I need you in my corner. Now, what do you do with such a commission? Uh, you remember those words, you cherish those words, and you put them into a mic talk. All right? Good. Um, corner man, that's uh, quite an interesting terminology. It comes from boxing. The corner man is somebody who sees the boxer, is present with the boxer, and whose presence strengthens the resolve of the boxer to achieve. Corner men, if you think of them, are there by design. They've got a specific purpose to fulfill. And they get involved depending on the ebb and flow of the fight. So take the cut man. The cut man gets involved when it becomes a bloody affair. I'm sure we've seen those guys when it becomes bloody and they desperately go to work between the rounds seeking to fix the laceration to stop the bleeding. And if they're successful, then the boxer can hopefully go on and achieve his goals, which is to win. Sam, my colleague had invited me into her corner. And what a privilege, and also what an incredible understanding or depth to her metaphor or analogy. Oh, I certainly think so. Because I gained three things from this corner man idea. The first thing is, Sam gets it. Anything in life that has meaning or is valuable has a hard part, yeah? You have to reckon with the hard part. We cannot have the things we want in life without confronting pain, fear, obstacles, hardship along the way. Take it, um, happiness, to achieve a goal, to master a skill, to have strong relationships will always require that we step out of our zone. To have wisdom means you need to work through pain. To have courage means you have to work through fear. There's always this through, this include and transcend. And if we don't reckon with the hard part, we're probably dead and buried before we start. Sam gets it. Now this notion of the hard part is beautifully expressed in a speech from 1910, 23rd of April. And uh, this guy gets up and he begins to start sharing and he says, it's not the critic who counts. Not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done things better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred with dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming. I'm not too sure whether some of you are familiar with that speech and who said it. Uh, but he carries on, but you can see he's equating achievement, whether it's winning or losing, to being in the arena. Just like Sam says, um, I need you in the corner because I'm in a ring. Theodore Roosevelt from um, American President, uh, 1910, and uh, he shares those words. I've used those words over and over again in my life to um, encourage myself to courage and to effort. And I've used them with other people to say, come on, we can do this. But you've got to reckon with the hard part. Nobody said this was going to be easy. Now, the muscle that we need in the arena and the ring is resilience. Absolutely convinced about that. Resilience is the ability to take the blows and uh, to keep coming back. It's rocky. One, two, three, four, five, <laughs> six. And then Sylvester Stallone got a bit old. Uh, 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 Resilience is um, the capacity or the ability of a person to maintain their integrity, to maintain their vision, to maintain their, um, their sense of purpose in the midst of the punches coming in, drastically changed circumstances. And that's why we get excited about resilience, because resilience is what keeps us on a path in spite of what's going on around us. 
But now here's the interesting thing. Sam doesn't only get that we need resilience and that we need to be in the ring, but she's getting something else that's an omission in Roosevelt's speech and possibly makes it a weakness. Now, did I actually say that? Uh, there's a weakness in the speech of the man in the arena. But think about it for a moment. We live in a culture that worships at the altar of individuality. Yeah? I grew up in a world where independence, self-actualization, self-achievement, doing it alone was uh, glorified, praised. Think about uh, the movies we enjoy watching. Can you think of some? Uh, James Bond saves the world alone. All right. Okay, maybe there's a pretty lady there a little bit, but it's all about him. Um, uh, Jason Bourne, Liam Neeson in Taken, shame, that poor guy is forever chasing after his daughter, but alone. Uh, think about how we describe some of our heroes. Churchill saved Europe. Really? Jobs created Apple. Seriously? And then we've got uh, some figureheads who have actually shown us uh, that there's no value in praising anybody else but themselves. And I think we can immediately think of one or two names that come to the fore there. This is the scourge of individuality. Now, this is quite dangerous. Uh, so here's some stats before COVID. This expression or this uh, appreciation for individuality alone leads us often into burnt out places and most and foremost, loneliness. Here's some stats. Nine, 2019 stats before COVID. One in five Americans say they are lonely most of the time, 20%. 13% of Italians say they have got nobody to turn to. We're talking Italians. What did these guys do in the last year? One million Japanese fit their government's definition of being socially recluse. Japan, in the last five weeks, in February, appointed a minister of loneliness to their cabinet because they're experiencing more deaths from suicide than COVID. All right? This thing called loneliness. I love Roosevelt, and I love this thing of being in the fight, but I recognize that resilience is always undergirded by things. And we need to focus on that. And Sam, by saying, come into my corner, says it's undergirded by connection. All right, which moves us away from this thing called loneliness. Now, Sam also shows me this. She shows me that there's a fight. She shows me that she needs support to engage the fight. But just that notion of all that balance causes her to go into wonderful places of good qualities. First of all, she shows humility. Sam's already an established professional HR person. All right? And she says, come into my corner. Sam therefore shows a growth mindset. A growth mindset is, I've never become, I'm becoming. I love Michelle Obama's title to her book, Becoming. A growth mindset says, I've never arrived. I'm always learning. And Sam says, in order for me to do this, I need to keep learning. Third thing Sam shows is proactivity. She's not waiting to be on the floor and she says, I've got a cut, I need a cut man. She says, let's put them in place beforehand. And this leads her to a thing called she designs. She designs her corner. Have any of you spent time in the last year saying, who's in my corner? Who should be in my corner? Because COVID has shown us more than ever that connection is so important. So let's uh, go on to that, and that's the essence of what we're going to be talking about for a couple of minutes, who should be in our corner. So let's use another analogy. Uh, you guys can see my picture over here. Imagine you are a star in a universe, but you are alone. I don't know about you, but I immediately feel anxiety because this picture doesn't look good. It looks like a flag, some nation's flag, but it's, uh, I don't want to be the star alone in the universe. So we've got to change that. But what do we do? Well, the first thing is we need to create a couple of orbits. Orbits are a dance. Orbits are a movement. And let's look at some of the orbits we might want to create. The first orbit we're probably looking at is the orbit of intimacy. We want to have an intimate orbit where the dance is connected and the dance is 
is really, really close. The second orbit that we want to engage is what we're going to talk about as being the personal or social orbit. Now remember, keep, keep trying to see these as dancers. I have a dance that's intimate. I have a dance that's personal and social. The third orbit is what we're going to talk about as being collective, the collective orbit, the collective dance. And then the fourth orbit is what we're going to call the distant dance. Now here's the thing about loneliness. I might have a great connection in the intimate dance, but because there's a, there's a bankruptcy in the collective dance, I feel lonely. And my particular, somebody who's in there could say, I don't quite get it. Each of these dances is absolutely essential to this thing of being connected in our universe. And the orbits are kept in space by a word called gravity. We're going to talk about that now. Now, now we're going to go through 10 stars that I think should come into this. And we're going to go through them very quickly, like, uh, like rounds in boxing. All right, you ready for the ride? Okay, first star. The first star is what we call the partner, which clearly fits into the intimate, intimate space. In the movie, Shall We Dance? Any of you remember that movie? Mrs. Clark has a conversation with a private investigator. She says to the private investigator, why do people get married? The private investigator says, oh, that's easy, passion. She says, no. She says, we need a witness to our lives. How good is that? She says, there's a billion people in this planet. Doesn't quite get a mass right there, but there's a billion people in the planet. And she says, does any one life really mean anything? But in marriage, you're promising to care about everything, the good things, the bad things, the terrible things, the mundane things, everything, all the time, every day. You're saying your life will not go unnoticed because I will notice it. Your life will not go unwitnessed because I will be your witness. All right? So, so good. The partner is the person who notices even the mundane. Now, the vehicle could be marriage. The vehicle could be something else. It could be an, an adult child with a, with, a, with a parent. But is the life witnessed? Secondly, let's go to our next star. We're going a little bit further out. Kind friends. Kind friends, close companions. This little boy comes home from school and he says to his uh, grandmother, I found a new friend. She says to him, is he kind? Of all the questions the grand can ask him, she asks the kindness question. Because she's lived long enough to realize that friendship and kindness go hand in hand. How strange that some people we call friends actually make us feel shamed or low or don't respect the boundaries. Kind friends sit in this space over here. Two contrasting definitions of a kind friend. They're there when everybody else goes out. They're there when the going is really good and bliss. Because to be a kind friend, you celebrate the goodness of your mate without a sense of, of uh, why. Kind friends. Do we have kind friends? Let's go. Star number three. Are we going to push out a little bit? Okay. Star number three, collectors. Famous, most famous artist in the world, lived many years ago, Leonardo da Vinci. All right. Probably uh, responsible for the two most amazing pieces of art ever, Mona Lisa and uh, The Last uh, Supper. He has an interesting thing about da Vinci. He never did it alone. He was always working shoulder to shoulder with people. If you look at the Mona Lisa, it's mostly his work, but other guys, oh, there's, there's a touch of other people in there. It's interesting um, to, um, to uh, go to the game reserve, and uh, we love going to the game reserve, but uh, it's nice to see a lion. It's even better to see a lion with somebody who appreciates it. Yeah? And collectors are purpose sharers. It's where we're together in something and we're energetic about it together. Cool? Goes into our collective mode. Let's keep pushing out loose ties. Here's something quite interesting. Um, loose ties are people who have clarity about us and they hopefully think fondly of us. I can't bry with everybody. But when other people are brying, does my name come up in the conversation and they say, what a nice guy, that's what he does. Do you know that uh, research has shown that more people are sitting in their current position in an organization because of the influence of a loose tie than people over here? It's sort of that notion, um, ah, we need this, uh, Wayne, uh, have you spoken to Wayne? Uh, the power of the loose ties, we don't bribe with them all the time, but they know us 
and they've got clarity around it. How strong is your loose tie, tie network? Cool. Uh, we're going to go one more step out. Uh, strangers. Ah. The best way to help yourself is to help somebody else. Now let's add to that. To help somebody else who can do you no good in return. That's what Samuel Johnson said. Malcolm Gladwell says that to assume the best of another person is the modern trait that has created our society. Those occasions that violate our trusting nature are tragic. But to go against that, to move away from trust, he says, that's far worse. Sometimes we're not rude to the stranger, but we're not polite either. Einstein asked this question, and it's probably the one question he never answered. Is the universe a friendly place? What well, depends. Some people see it as cruel. Others see it as a place of mystery, intrigue, and, and adventure. Maya Angelou says that we need to treat life as an adventure so we can make it as art. Love that. But I believe it's our approach to the stranger that's ultimately ask, answering that question. Uh, the smile, the connectedness, is probably showing the underlying belief of the world, the universe is a good place. Cool. What's our attitude like with the strangers? All right, so we've got five. We're going to go through the next five very quickly, and then we're going to land this plane. Let's go back in. Now, the next five are people with specific functions or specific purposes. The water buddy. The water buddy is probably sitting in this space here. What are water buddies? Water buddies are people who know the song in your heart, and they look at you and they say, you can take this deeper. They are the people who remind you of your song, and they say, I'm not going to let you get away with mediocrity. When I was leaving corporate many, many years ago, I had a border buddy who knew the song in my heart, and you're saying, Mike, you can do this. I needed him. All right? Do you have a border buddy? All right? The problem with a border buddy is we need to know, they need to know our song. Next one, masters or master. Um, he has an interesting and wonderful thought. Whatever you're going through at the moment, somebody has gone through that already. Whatever you're going through at the moment, somebody has studied, has spent hours so that they can shed light. I love the thought of the term guru. I don't know if anybody knows what uh, guru actually stands for, but it's somebody who dispels darkness. It's somebody who is with you and they're shedding light. Now, masters come in various forms. They come in terms of spiritual advisors, uh, coaches, mentors, um, counselors, therapists, name it. Um, I need to make sure that I don't fall into the scourge of trying to do this alone and saying, let's bring people in. Cool. Uh, when was the last time you approached a master? Models. Oh, one of my favorite. If Roger Federer is your model or reference point, you're renegotiating retirement age. <laughs> if Trevor Noah is your model, uh, disadvantage does not define you. If the young girl who woke up today in the Cape Flats, who has a terrible abusive past history, and she wakes up into this tiny house of two rooms with six other people, is your model, and she still has a vision, you too can have a vision no matter what you're going through. All right? Who are our reference points? Who are our models? If the slob who's complaining about everything is your model, guess what? You're doing the same. Who's the model? Hippies. Two more to go. Steve Jobs and Bono from U2 once had a conversation, and they said, how come all the major inventions of the 60s, 70s, and 80s came from hippies? The guys who didn't wear deodorant, who were barefoot, had the long hair, and the answer that they came up with, with was they were countercultural. Right? When last did you have a conversation with somebody who really stretched you? But you weren't offended or defensive in it. You and I, if we're going to really grow, need the hippies in our lives. Hippies make your argument deeper or your perspective wider. Right? You always know you've got a hippie in your life because they make you feel a bit uncomfortable. You don't have to agree with them, but they, they make you go deeper. Lastly, the adversary. The critic is part of the ecosystem. I often want everybody to love my work. And I've realized um, that's not going to happen. And then I get so upset about the one person who did it. 
uh, and who maybe says something. Elon Musk uh, recently said this. He's talking about products, but he says, find the people who talk negatively about your stuff. You find them and hear them. They might be a jerk, but find them. Do we elicit the opposer into our universe? Ten stars, ten planets. How, do, how, how are you guys doing on those? I'm sure as you're listening to them, some of them are strengths, and some of them might go, oh, this needs a little bit of work. So let's uh, close this. What do we do with this? First and foremost, uh, you'll notice that this is very inclusive and diverse. When we're talking about connection, we're often talking about, do you have a friend? Yes, we need kind friends. But this is about inclusivity, inclusivity and diversity. We've got to get a spectrum of people, first thing. Second thing, the best medicine we can give anybody is human connection, grounded in compassion and love. Vivek Murphy, from, um, he was a, the, the um, general in, in uh, Barack Obama's time, uh, beautifully says that this is the best medicine. Healing comes through connection. As we listen to this, uh, one of the thoughts might be, are we reaching out? Are we, are, are we actually inviting ourselves into other people's corner? Because other people need it, and COVID has shown, shown us that. The third thing, and uh, I know I'm dealing with uh, a lot of people here from corporate, is uh, this universe of all the stars talks to us about a culture of connection. And every one of those stars has got a hard question to it. Let me just give you two examples. The partner asks this question. In your organization, do people feel noticed? Yeah, sure, we notice them when they do something great. But is the mundane noticed? Let's go to the border, baby. In your organization, do we know the dreams and passions of people? And is there somebody in that organization who's looking at that person and saying, take this deeper? I'm not going to be your cheerleader. I'm not going to let you get away with mediocrity because I believe in you. And if we had time, I could go through every star and say, these stars are asking us hard questions in terms of our organization. Now, there's something which I haven't mentioned here. Um, connection comes about because we've got people in our corner, and connection comes about because of gravity. And gravity is this word called trust, trust-building behavior. So in our resilience in a box, when it comes to connection, for those of you who are familiar with it, there's two areas that we focus on. Who's in the corner? There's a card about the mentor. There's a card about the adversary. But then there's a lot of cards which are about uh, trust-building practices. So a couple of years ago, 1994, many years ago, I ran Comrades. And I finished Comrades in a time of just over eight hours. That was the goal. What made Comrades possible? Well, I joined a group of runners just up the road here called Regents Harriers. It's about 400, 500 people that meet in the morning and they just run. Regent Harriers became my collectives. It was great to run with people who every morning spoke Comrades. While running with Regent Harriers, I began to get to know two other guys. They called Brad and Simon were their names. They ran the same pace as I did. And we developed a little bit of a friendship. But not only that, uh, we developed a common goal, run comrades with a time of eight something. We, on 31st of May, 1994, we were at the Durban Town Hall. They were my partners. We were going to witness each other's race. My father-in-law came down for the race from the Cape. My father-in-law knew my running ability. He knew my dream to run comrades. And he came down and he was my border buddy. Just having him there meant I was going to finish that race. Uh, there was no way. All right. My mother-in-law was down. Mandy was there. Some of other friends were there. And they were along the road um, up to Peter Maritzburg. And every now and again, they would see me and I would hear them call out my name. They were my kind friends. We leave uh, Durban up towards Peter Maritzburg, and I'm running with a group of strangers. But the universe, the comrades, is a good place. We're smiling with each other, and we're cheering each other along. After all, it's called comrades. Cool. Then something interesting happens um, in my race, uh, unexpected. I get to halfway, and in the business of halfway, I lose my two partners. I don't know whether they're ahead of me or behind me. It just, it just happened. 
And so I set out by myself, not knowing if I should run faster to catch them or whether I should stop to make, for them to catch up to me. Um, I'm alone. For the first time, I notice, uh, starting to cramp a little bit, I notice that there's taxis on the side of the road and there's runners inside who have given up. And they seem to be saying, come, join us. <laughs> and I look at them, they are my worthy adversaries, and I say, not a chance. All right, not a chance. It's tempting, don't tempt me. I get to Nchanga, and uh, there is a little bit of doubt, uh, cramp setting in. I look at a signboard which says 39 kilometers to go. This guy comes along. His name is Ian. Ian's from Regents. I don't like Ian because Ian's got a story that's better than everybody else's story. <laughs> he looks at me. He sees I'm in trouble. He says, I'm going to run with you. Ian's running his 10th comrades. He's a master. He stays with me for 26 kilometers, and he coaches me along that route, saying, eat a banana. Let's walk. Let's run. We're going to get there. There's Peter Marisburg there. We get to the bottom of Polly Shorts, and he says to me, you're going to make it. There's another mate of mine that I want to go and help now. And I have a newfound respect for Ian. And I get up to the top and finish comrades. Imagine I say to you guys today, I think I'm going to run to Peter Marisburg tomorrow from Durban. The first star. One, I'm not ready for it, but worst of all, there's nobody around me. We can't do life with nobody around us. Connection enables resilience. Who's in your corner? Thank you very much.